I've never done this before. I've got this pattern piece here, I made from a cardboard pattern. It's going to be the hand guard for that pirate cutlass, so I'm going to try to dish it out. i got to bend it. It's uh, 1 16th inch steel. I've got a slot in there for the blade, initial slot. I'll probably have to widen it. I've got a tool here that I made for forming the butt plates of rifles. It's curved, so I'm going to try to use that, try to form this. Need my tongs. It won't take much heat to get this pretty dirt hot. It's gotta go kind of easy with it. Seems to be working. Stitching it out nice. Now keep it hot though. It gets hot fast and also cools fast with the same heat. And be careful I don't burn it. I think it's going to work. The light hammer is the right one for this kind of work. Show up real good, but it's it's dishing it right out. Maybe I can show it. It's it's working pretty good. I think it'll work all right. It's going to take a while. It's going to be a lot of hammer. It's going to work it back along this way, and then bend it, bend it around the curve. Here. What I'm going to do now is put a curl on the end here. On this part, I'm going to curl it over like I did on those other wall hooks. It's make a, like a thing that would be on a sword. It would catch a blade so it wouldn't go over the top and get your arm. It's a little hook there that I've seen on some old pirate cutlasses that I've studied. Uh, real fast, so I gotta watch it. Getting there. A little more. It'll be a little bit bigger than the the ones on the wall hooks. But this is gotta be really careful. If I get it too hot, it'll melt right off of there.
Good. I like that. I'm going to go with that. Now I got to bend this rest of this part down. I'm going to dish it out and bend it. Finish the guard. just a little bit at a time and I'll get my bend in there. Working too much, too hard, fast, it'll kink and I don't want you to do that. You got to pound out your kinks. I'd rather just take it easy and not get the kinks in there. I'm going to go get my measuring tape because I want to keep five inches in between here. Shop's so new, I don't even have a measuring tape out right here yet. I'll correct that. This is the cardboard pattern I used. I just made something that uh, looked like it would fit around my hand good. And this is for the pattern for the handle part of the blade. Get in there. Like that. So it'll be yeah, something like that. So that's, that's what I'm after. Uh, just about there. Pretty nice. Now I've got adjusted. I got my five inch of it. That looks like a pirate cutlass hilt, doesn't it? So I'm just refining up these edges. These parallel. Well, that looks pretty darn good. I think it's done. Except for the, the filing and polishing, it's dished out nice. Got a nice curve to it. Now I'll go on this blade here. happy with it. it. Turned out pretty good. And that looks like a pirate cutlass hilt. Whatever it's all on. So we're working on this pirate cutlass. And what I'm after here is pounding the edges down. I want a wedge shape. I want wider at the back and a little flat area, and then it's going to slope down to its edge. And as you, when you're pounding metal, it expands from the point of impact in all directions. And you can kind of direct it in the way when way you want to go a little bit. But as it expands, when I pound this edge, it's putting the curve in it. Now I might put too much curve in, I might have to take some out from the end of here. So what I'm doing is working it down, working this edge down. I got my point 
shape pretty much. I'll be grinding it to its final shape. I'm thinning it down. I want a little less than a quarter inch, between three sixteenths and a quarter inch, and then I want to taper it out to a nice edge. I'll leave it flat on the end, about at least a sixteenth of an inch, so the metal won't burn. So I'm just uh, heating her up and working her down, and see if we can make this piece of steel look like a cutlass. section at a time. I gotta work this section to blend in with these two and I can keep on working back along the blade. Gonna have to take some of that curve out possibly when it's starting to look like a scimitar rather than a cutlass. Now that's not too bad, it's shaping it up. So that's looking pretty good. Now I'm running into a situation here. I'm going as far as I can go without hitting the back of my drum here. So I'm gonna have to, we're doing swords, I'm gonna have to cut a hole in the back so that this can stick through so that I can get to this part of the blade. So I knew I was gonna have to do that. So that's about as far as I can go until I figure out. But that's shaping up to looking about like what I wanted. Starting to look like a cutlass. Well, I got the hole cut in the back of the forge so I can get them sword blades through there. Now, let me forge the parts I couldn't reach before. I got this 50 gallon drum as a shroud and it works real well, except on a long blade I hit the back end of it. So now I got a hole there I can shove that blade on through and forge the rest of it. Got my wall hooks up. That one turned out really good. That one you can see, I burned it a little bit there. Actually melted the metal. It doesn't uh, bother mild steel too bad. But uh, it's a good time to go into the heats that I'm using and the metal. When you start heating up a piece of steel in the forge, a piece of unpolished steel, first thing you start seeing is it'll start glowing red. It'll start getting a dull red is what they call it when it first starts getting red. And you keep heating it and then it'll go into it'll get brighter and brighter, it'll go into what they call a cherry red which is actually a hardening color. And then it'll get into bright red, and then into orange, and then what we call the yellow forging heat, which is mostly what you see me working in, and uh, which is the metal is about as soft as it's gonna get for forging without burning the metal. And when you go on from there, it'll get white hot. And when then you're approaching a welding heat where the metal's getting ready to melt, and if you pull it out of the forge and it looks like a sparkler, and there's sparks 
coming off the metal before you start pounding it. Then you're going to get what they call a welding heat. And if it's a piece of carbon steel, that's actually your carbon leaving your steel and it's altering the metallurgy of your steel. And you don't want to do that if it's going to, something you're going to be wanting to temper or if it's a carbon steel that you want for a sword or a knife blade, you don't want to chase your carbon out of it. A piece of mild steel, coal roll or hot roll mild steel, which is regular metal that, that you get, it doesn't really hurt it that much, except it'll make it look funny on the surface if the surface starts to melt. You could forge it, you could file it, but it'll, if you burn it, it'll, when you're actually melting the steel, it'll make it kind of porous and it's not as strong as it was. Now if you're welding two pieces together, forge welding, then you want it to be that welding heat with the sparks leaving and you put both ends on the anvil and you pound the metal together and then you forge it. When you forge it, you're compacting those grains of metal and you're hammering it back into one good solid piece of steel. But for our forging here, I don't want to get it that hot. I want to keep it at like our yellow forging heat. If you try to forge something with cherry red, you're going to wear yourself out and you're going to find the metal doesn't shape very good. So you're up there in the orange and the yellow forging temperatures, but you're very close to white hot. And from white hot, you're very close to melting and changing your metal. And you, I just had the ends of these pieces of spring steel that just melt right off if you leave them in there too long. So you got to watch your heat. And uh, it's like I said, it's more critical if you're using carbon steel. And that's why I want to go into the metal I'm using for these sword blades. Uh, I'm using car, uh, it's a spring steel, what I've got here, when I can get it. It's a uh, spring steel stock, it's what they use to make truck springs out of. It's never been made into a truck spring yet. It's, untempered, unhardened, and untempered, but it's really tough steel. And that's what I'm hammering these blades out of here, and that's what I use for my Bowie knives. And on the Bowie knives, this is a piece of spring steel also from that uh, truck spring stock. Now I do harden and temper these. I could do a whole video on heat treating, and I probably will, but just to touch on it for now, uh, the, with the buoy knives, I heat them, you heat them up to a cherry red, because as you're doing your forging, you're hammering, you're setting up a lot of stresses in the metal, and the metal it bends, and you have to keep straightening it, so you get a lot of stresses in the metal, and, but, and the metal is in a soft state, it's annealed, because once you heat it up, red hot and it cools slowly and anneals it. The slower you cool it, the softer it will get. So when you're ready to heat treat it and temper it, and harden and temper it, it's two separate operations. I'll heat this up cherry red, hold it there for a little while, all the stress relief, and I'll put it in oil. If you go into water, it makes it a little more brittle because it, it cools it quicker. And I like oil because it makes it a little tougher, not quite as hard, but it's a little tougher and you go into the oil with it but then you're at your maximum hardness and it's brittle it can't break and the sharp edge will chip so the tempering process is actually drawing some of that hardness out and what you have to do with since we don't have a temperature control oven we just have a forge or when i'm heat treating i like to use a torch not as traditional but you have more control and it does a better job and you Polish it up after you've heated a cherry red, gone into the oil. Polish it up so you can watch your tempering colors. And I'll start at the back and along the spine. And you'll watch the colors change. And at first you'll start seeing like a straw yellow, which is a good edge for an edge, good color for an edge because it'll be very hard to hold an edge, but it's a little on the hard side, it'll tend to chip. And then it'll go into like a purple, and then it'll go into blue. A blue is spring temper. If you go above a blue, you'll start making it softer. So what I like to do is chase a blue heat 
on my, the part that's the handle and the base of the blade along the spine, keep that blue and chase it down into like a brown, a purple, and then maybe a brown. Uh, I don't like to use uh, straw yellow because it, it makes an edge that's easy to chip. And I find a, a purple or a brown makes a really nice hard edge. It's not that hard to sharpen and, and the blue along here will make a really springy blade. There'll be less chance of breaking. But uh, I can go into that in very much detail, but I like to do it when I have some blades to temper so I can actually show the operation in progress. On the swords, I do things a little different because of the size of them. It's, I can't, you to do a proper hardening and tempering, you have to bring the whole entire blade to cherry red at one time. And I can't do this in my small forge, and I can't do it really with a torch. But you do get a lot of stresses set up in the blade from pounding, heating and pounding. So what I do with the swords is called normalizing. And I do that with a torch because I do have more control. And what you do is you bring it up to a cherry red, starting at the, as much as I can keep at a cherry red with a torch, and just hold it there for a few seconds, and lets all the stresses relieve, and keep working it back, working it back along the blade, and working it back, and let it cool normally in air. And it makes what is called a normalized blade. And with this spring steel, that's going to be one tough blade. And I do that with my swords and with my throwing knives. Because when you do that, you're, you, they won't break. It's really hard to break one of those blades. They'll bend before they'll break. This is my samurai sword. I made this several years ago, and it's out of spring steel. In fact, it's the, the matching piece to this cutlass blade. I actually cut this piece of two and a half inch wide spring steel down the middle with a hacksaw uh, in my spare time. It took me a couple of weeks. Um, but it, this is normal I did it with the torch. And uh, I've used this to chop firewood and to shape timber. It's very, very strong and springy. And it's really a good blade. It holds an edge fairly well. Probably not as good as it would if it was hardened and tempered. But uh, it's a really tough blade and it's been a really good sword. It's done everything I've ever asked the sword to do, which has been chop firewood and shape timbers. So that's what the, the process I'm going to use on these two other sword blades I'm building here. Uh, these are old truck springs. It's good stuff. Uh, you got to be kind of careful with it because sometimes if you'll get a fatigued spring, uh, it can crack when you're hardening it if you're going to harden it. If you're, not going to harden it, it's probably all right. Usually what I'll do is I'll take a sample of the leaf if I have any doubts about it and heat it up cherry red and throw it in water and see if it cracks. And if it cracks, then I won't use anything from that leaf. And the one here is broken. And that's a suspect leaf. That could have fatigue. I've made some really good knives out of old files. And now we're talking about a high carbon content steel, really critical if it's heat treating. Uh, it can make a really brittle knife. Uh, you have to draw the, draw a good temper out on it, but it'll also hold an edge like crazy. And uh, it'll make a really good hard knife. Probably not recommended for a throwing knife or chopping firewood, but uh, for a carbon knife or a skinning knife, you just can't beat it. It's really good steel with kind of a hard, high carbon content so it uh, it's very brittle right after you harden it so you have to draw a temper on it polish it out draw a temper on it and uh, it leads to a straw yellow or hotter and you'll have a really good knife be a little harder to sharpen than the spring steel but it's holding the edge a little bit longer First I gotta chop some firewood because I build I move out the coals and and build a little wood fire in the middle and get it blazing pretty good, then I'll take 
two shovelfuls of fresh coal and put on top of that. And then once I get that blaze going pretty good, then I can rake in those puffed up cinders of coke in from the sides and then I'll get my good fire. So I'm gonna start out building a wood fire right in the middle of, uh, right over the air vent. And I also got this thing here. And when it's hot, you gotta make sure you use a, a good glove. And I've got a thing on the bottom of my forge I can open up to uh, let out all the ash and stuff. And there's a plate in there in the bottom of that truck brake drum with slots in it. And so I got a tool here. It may eventually be a knife blade. And I use that to clear out those slots. Because the fine stuff will get down in there and it'll plug up the slots. The air won't get through there. And once in a while you have to do that until you get your big puffed up cinders. And when they're laying down in there, they'll let the air come up through. And uh, then it'll get that coal really hot. And uh, then you can get some metal hot. So right now, I'm going to chop some wood and build me a fire. My good old axe made out of water pipe and truck spring. Works really good. Just had to show that. Yeah, that ought to get her going. And a little fresh coal on top, a little air. Passage is nice and clear now, so I can get plenty of air through there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's getting hot. I'm going to have a fire going here. I made this piece to cover up the hole in the back there. Maybe you can't see it much now for when I'm not forging swords. I'll just put this on the inside and it'll cover up that hole so my coals won't go out the back. I'll probably lose. Some cold out the back. <laughs> Not much coming out now. It'll just drop down here on the ground. I got a dirt floor in the blacksmith shop. No, I probably won't lose too much out there, but I'll let that blade pass through so I can get the part I'm wanting to form in the middle of the fire. And it's the only way I can forge a blade longer than a foot long. Now I'm getting a good bed of coals. And the flames will die down. Coals will start to glow. I'll start using water to concentrate my heat in the center. And pretty soon she'll be ready to put a piece of metal in it. And I got that cutlass blade in there. So I can start forging from where I left off. And start hammering this blade out. Now what I'm going to do is forge it out. This blade I'm going to make about 24 inches long. But my research on most cutlasses, they vary from like 21 inches to 26 inches. A cutlass was a shorter blade, a very fast blade used for fighting in close quarters like on a ship deck or Henry Morgan used them pretty well in the streets of Panama and Portobello. But they were for close in fighting, working really fast and uh, cutting and slashing and stabbing and all the things you do with a sword. So anyway, this one's going to wind up being about 24 inches long. That's what my samurai sword is and it's a really nice length. Every bladed weapon is a compromise. You know, one particular blade is perfect for everything, but uh, they're different blades for different types of work. 
And this one right here is going to be a pirate cutlass for that type of work. It's starting to come up to heat. Now this is kind of a dull red heat. It's maybe right in the middle there it's getting to be cherry red. So I'm approaching my temperature. Go a little higher than that. And I'll show you what the cherry red looks like. It's when it's starting to get bright. That hole is working really well. I can get this blade right in there. The part that I'm wanting to forge. Okay, this is like a cherry red. The middle is almost coming to bright red. And from there it will go into my yellow forging heat, which is where the metal works the best. If I go any beyond that, it'll, it'll go into a white heat, which is what I don't want, because then I'll be altering my metal. There's a fine line between that and when the sparks start leaving the metal, where you're in a, in a welding heat. I don't want that because I'm not welding. A lot of the old swords were forged at welding heat. They didn't have the the uh, metal that we have today, the alloy steel. They had to make their own by actually pounding the carbon into the blade. And they would hammer different metals together, hard steel with soft steel, and twist them and hammer them and make the Damascus blades and fold them. And uh, they had to make their own alloys that way, where we can get this truck spray in there. Now, that's, there's my yellow forging heat. That's what I want. Nice. As soon as it cools down to a dull red, you can feel that metal getting harder. It's just not going anywhere. You're just beating on it and it's not doing anything. And then you gotta go back in the fire. So I'm just gonna start working this on here until I got it forged out there about two feet long, about 24 inches. And then I'll get the curve the way that kind of I want it. But then I'll probably go back where it's a little wide on the edge here. But right now I'm forging this edge, just trying to make it go that way too. So I'm moving metal in all directions. So once I get it all forged out the length that I want, about like this is, I'll probably go back over this edge and have, so I can thin this edge out a little bit. Because anything I can hammer out saves time grinding, and I'd rather hammer than grind, actually. So then I'll uh, work it back, and I'll refine my curve till it's what I want. All right, and then I'll probably thin the handle area out a little bit, and then I'll be ready for grinding. So right now, it's back in the fire for more hammering. And I can work that out, some of my coals coming out the back. That's all right, I can always shovel it back in. And back to heat and beat. Oh, this is fun. I love this stuff. Now, what I want to mention about the water it's better to put the water in to control your fire without the metal being in there. It's not so important with mild steel, with the carbon steel. If the water splashes on the blade, it can make a hard spot there and make it brittle. So I always put the water in to control my fire when the metal is not in there. And then uh, you put the metal in, and then it's fun. Starting to get a little bigger than I want it. I want to keep it concentrated right in the middle over the air hole, otherwise I'm just wasting coal. Also, I remember to use my glove. I think it's going to start getting pretty hot if I don't use my glove. I'll be noticing it. Besides that, the jagged metal can tear up your hand, so I always like to use a glove on this hand. My hammer hand, no, I like to kind of feel what the hammer is doing. But on this metal handling hand, I'll use my welding glove. Well, it's coming along. 
And I was losing some of my coals out there, so I put this pan for it to fall in, and I just scoop them up with my shovel and shove them back in. So I'm working my way down that blade. Also got to straighten it sideways. So I'm going. If you side down an old hand forged blade, you'll see waviness in it. You'll see that it's not perfectly straight, and that's how you can tell a handmade blade from a factory-made blade. One that's stamped out of a sheet of metal probably going to be perfectly straight. A hand forged blade is not. It's going to have irregularities. But that's the way the old blades were, and that's the way this one's going to be. That's got about the right curve. And I'm going back and refining my edge, thinning it down. Straightening it as I go and taking out the curve so I can get that's about the right curve that I want. That's looking like a cutlass and that's what I want. Then I'll probably go back in and fire with this and thin this handle out a little more. Put a slight back curve in it. So I'm gonna put the handle real well. And this blade is just about where I want it, just about ready for grinding. That's coming out really nice. I really like it. Uh, a little more heat camera and it'll be there. Okay, well this thing got awful hot. So I'm cooling the handle area down with a little water. That's okay to do because it's not red hot here. It's just getting too warm to hang on to. So then what I'm doing now is working my way down the blade, uh, thinning out the edge and thinning the, the back part of the blade also and straightening it as I go and I'm doing the final hammering on this blade and when I do the handle part I'm going to have to let it cool down I don't want to cool it with water because it's carbon steel so I'm going to have to let this thing cool off so I can hold on to the other end and thin out the handle area and forge it to the shape that I want and then this blade will be ready for grinding so I'm almost done hammering on this thing but it's shaping up pretty darn good this is one way to see if you got an even curve in the blade running along the anvil. Where the gap gets bigger, you got more curve. So that's pretty good. Right there is a little more than, than what I got there. So there's one spot right in the middle of the blade where I need to take a little curve out right there. But other than that, it's shaping up. Doing pretty good, pretty straight, got the right curve what I want in it. So I got a little more curve. If it uh, doesn't have an even curve on it, it can be hard to get out of the scabbard. So I want not a lot of curve, but a nice even curve. So I'm just about there. I'll take a little bit more out right in the middle, and then it'll be right where I want it. Okay, this blade is pretty much finished forging. I got the curve I want in it. And it's pretty straight. I run it in and out of the fire after I was doing hammering to kind of give it an initial normalizing and try to get as much of the blade red hot at the same time as I could. I didn't film it because it makes such a terrible sound running in and out through that drum. Maybe I can put a heavier piece of metal around there to minimize that. But so anyway, then I went along and, and just straightened anything that didn't look perfectly straight. 
I mean, there's enough metal on it so I can grind most of the irregularities out and, and you end up getting a pretty nice blade. The curve is about right, about what I wanted. And uh, that's going to be the cutlass. Now I got to let this cool down so it's break time. And then if this end's going in, and then I got to forge the handle part of it. And I've got my pattern here. The cardboard piece that I made. These anymore. And it's got a little bit of curve in it, what fit my hand. And then I just got to hammer that in, thin it down a little bit, and leave enough metal so that I can grind it the final shape with my actual hand. And then get the angle of the handle to the blade where it's what I want. Now uh, then it'll be going in the vise and attacking it with the grinders and the files and taking it to final shape. Before I take it down to its final thin edge, I'll uh, normalize it again with the torch. And I'll just play the torch over it, just keep the whole thing as close as I can to red hot uh, for maybe a minute. And then uh, just let it cool in the air and it'll be normalized. Uh, Spring steel should be a really tough blade, and then I can finish grinding the edge and file it and shaping the, the blade to fit the hilt. And the uh, final uh, grinding, filing, and polishing, and we should have a cutlass. So, anyway, uh, that thing's got to cool down enough for me to hold, and I can finish doing the handle in and then cut the excess off, and we'll have a blade blank. Pretty exciting stuff. Well, she's cooled down enough. Now I got the handle in in the fire. So I'm going to forge that area. And then this blade will be basically finished forging. There will be a lot of grinding and filing on it. But uh, I'm really liking the way it turned out. It's the impurities that cook out of that coal and they'll go down to the bottom and clog up your air hole so you don't get enough air through and you just gotta stop and dig them out. They get hot but they won't glow and keep them out of like coal will. All they do is block your air. If you can't get air through there and you can't get a hot fire so you gotta dig these out. You don't wanna handle them while they're hot. These are old ones I dug out before I started the fire. So anyway, in every fire, a few clinkers must form. Just got to dig them out, and you can get your air going through there again. So. Clinkers. So I'm grinding the profile of my blade and taking off those humps and bumps and smoothing it out. And I'm going to get the actual profile that I want on this blade. 
and I'll be taking it down some width wise and, and smoothing it out and getting what I want the blade to look like. And then with the handle I'll be taking it down and leaving a ledge where I want the, the hilt to butt up against. And this squared part here will be going through the squared hole in the back. And then it'll be heated up red hot and peened over to hold everything in place. And then when the wood grips are on here, they'll butt up tight against the front of the hilt and hold hard against that ledge. So this this handle area will have to go from small here to large so that I can slip this on. It'll have to be a little bit smaller back here than it is up here. So this will get tight when it goes on. So that's what I'm doing now. Basically I'm going to grind the shape of this blade. And that's just a lot of grinding. And uh, use up a lot of wheels. You just got to get a lot of wheels. Because you'll be going through them and you'll be making a lot of dust. So you want to make sure you wear safety glasses and a respirator. You don't want to be breathing it. You don't want it in your eyes. Because uh, it's going to take a lot of grinding. And then I'll be finishing it up draw filing it. The draw filing is when you use a file and you pull it like that. And you only you want to pull it with the handles when you normally are filing, you have the handle in your right hand, you're filing like that, away from you. And the teeth on a file go a certain way, so if you were to pull it like this, it would be like pulling a file backwards, you don't want to do that. So you want to have, when you draw file, you want to have the handle in your left hand, and then you pull the file like this. And you can get a really smooth finish, and a really even finish on it. But right now, going to be back to grinding so I get the profile of this place. Got the hand guard fitted to my cutlass now. Handle area is final shape so now I'm concentrating on the blade. I'm going to do the profile first, grind the top and grind the bottom. I'm going to thin it down some of edgewise and then I gotta thin it way down sideways I to make it lighten it up a little bit. I'm thinking of grinding in a fuller into it. Never done that before so what the heck. Maybe I'll try. I got the top almost profile. I'm gonna make a nice smooth curve there and then then do the, the blade. I'm gonna have it about uh, about an inch and three eighths thick, inch and a quarter and an inch and three eighths. I'm gonna make these handle pieces out of walnut, the same walnut as uh, the gun stocks are made out of. I've fitted this end into the front of the hand guard and clamped it on there, drilled the holes. First I drill holes through the blade here and then I clamp the each handle on and drill through from the inside. And I've got the countersunk screw heads there and then these the nuts embedded in the wood. I'll set them in a little deeper the way I usually make my handle. So now I'm filing these edges down to the blade and then I'll file this so that that clears the, the back part of the guard and then round them off and these will pretty much be done. Taking this down to the metal. I really like the way this is shaping up. It's just a lot of grinding. From this I'll go to the wheels, start out with a 60, the uh, uh, resin back wheels. Taking the grinding marks off.
These are my experimental fuller grinding. The one on the bottom is really ragged. I tried to do that with the four and a half inch disc. And it's just really hard to keep it straight. The one on top, I did with my Dremel tool with these little sanding discs on them. Now I have to buy a whole, maybe a couple of packages of, of those uh, drums, little sanding drums. But it does a pretty nice job. I tried using one of those little grinding wheels, but they, they don't do very good. And with this area in here, not too bad. And not, I think that's what I'll use. Uh, they, they grind real good. It doesn't take too much off at once. It's going to take some time, but just uh, go slow in a little bit of time. I think I can get a real nice fuller. I'm going to grind my fuller in here. I've got it... Uh, masked off. I'm uh, going to start at 3 sixteenths from the upper edge and make it about 3 eighths wide. I'm uh, starting at an inch and a half from the hilt and it's 16 inches long. Yeah, the Dremel tool did pretty good. Took uh, three drums aside, six drums total. And I made this uh, modified rat tail file. So yeah, I'm liking it. I, I got a fuller. I wasn't sure I was going to get a fuller, but uh, I got one. Well, I'm working it down with a 220 dry. Pick some of the big scratches out, and then I'm going over with the 220 wet. I'll get some of the major scratches out, and when I go on the wheel, I don't have to take any deep. And then in the groove. We've had the hilt on the wheel. Oh, pretty good. I'm making a wooden scabbard for the cutlass. This is Quarter inch plywood is the blade. Is it started out as quarter inch thick. It's a little thinner than that now. What I did is laid it on the plywood and traced around it, and then pulled it back, and then traced around wherever it crosses the line, keeping it centered in between where it enters up here and wherever it. It drags up here and goes over the line here. I marked it all the way out, so hopefully it'll clear. That's the way I did the scabbard on my samurai sword and on the uh, serpentine buoy. So anyway, so now I'm cutting this off with my coping saw. need to relieve any high spots. Looks like it'll go in pretty good. Yep. Yeah. That'll look pretty good. Next step will be to glue this down on another piece of quarter inch ply and I'll just glue around this edge. And I'll be cutting this down within uh, a little over a quarter inch from the edge here but it would be too flimsy like this so while it's intact I'm going to glue it down on this other piece of quarter inch plywood
I'm cutting through both pieces. I'm staying three eighths of an inch outside of this area. And I can always file it down. It gives me an inch either side to play with to smooth it out. Or this. So <clears throat> it's almost a quarter. This is a quarter inch wide. This is almost a quarter inch. So that I probably leave like it is. I want at least like a 32nd. As I come down here, take some more off of there. Take almost a 16. So I'm just going to take it down here where the blade would be a little loose. I'm going to take that down. Good old hillbilly belt sander. I can check my depth. Yeah, that's actually almost a 64th over a quarter inch. So I can wear that in there. Well. Okay, we'll, see. Well, I'll do that once I get this side glued on. I don't want to thin this down a little bit. Taking some down there so I don't have too much really room in there. So the next thing I'm going to do is, is uh, glue this down to here. I'll cut that out. I'm going to do that with epoxy resin. I'm going to coat this all inside here. Soak this down with, real good with resin. Resin needs to see there. Then resin this area here. And then I'm going to use the, the resin to glue this on there with. I'll cut that up. Then when I cut that out, I'll have the basic plywood scabbard. And then I'm going to take it down, smooth it up, round it off real good. And then fiberglass it with the uh, resin and cloth. Looks like it's going to work pretty good. The resin caused it to tighten up some, so... Not real round. Yeah, that should work. Now I just got to cut it out. A little tight spot, but that keeps it from rattling. Eventually, work itself out. The first layer of glass. I want it down past center onto the other side there, and I'll trim that off. And now this is going to be the inside of the, of the scabbard, so that then the outside will overlap on the ends. It's double, double thickness on the edges. Here's the sheath finished. I sanded it down and. Uh, and shot it with some of this camo brown. I ordered a dark brown baldric for it, but uh, works pretty good. So yeah. <laughs> I've got a brass three eighths to half inch bell reducer and I'm gonna make it into a, a pommel for my cutlass. I decided to put a pommel on it and help it with its balance. Go on back here. I guess it won't look like a pipe fitting. <laughs> Hopefully. This is my pommel finished. I put a brass plug in it and then ground and file it all around. And the way I devised for holding it on, this is a piece of a motorcycle spoke. This is the spoke nut. And I, did, I cut a, a slot in the end here and just brazed this in. This goes on like that. I 
is so I have this full width tang here and that'll go on there and tighten down and all it needs is polishing now.